Now, Granel does not assert that the three vectors of ex-European modernity that are gradually shaping the developed world and give it its essential determination can simply be met with a philosophical response that overcomes the fate of philosophy described in the last point. He does not hope to rescue hu European humanity with philosophy. On the contrary, he presumes that something like philosophical thought only issues from existential configurations that weave ethical, religious, moral, political, and socioeconomic usages into singular formations articulated by natural languages, and that we must attend to these for those formations to glimpse the possibilities of what, what we might call a philosophical effectivity. Of course, he recognizes that this very assumption has its philosophical basis, and he acknowledges quite clearly what those bases are. Once again, they lie in Heidegger's recasting of phenomenology and in contemporary approaches to that project. But Canel is clearly suggesting that a post-Heideggerian thought of the essential finitude of being, which inscribes it in language and obliges us to think the human being, human being in relation to this inscription, is possible in Europe or has viable conditions there, and that the forms of life that will compose the figure of Europe find a concrete articulation in a post-Heideggerian thinking. This does not imply, as far as philosophy goes anyway, that only Heidegger's thought captures the truth of Europe or a path for articulating it. The very thought of the finitude of being would exclude such a conclusion. But it does suggest that a thinking engagement with Heidegger and his legacy helps us approach the real grounds of our factical situation in Europe that something of truth in Europe can be drawn forth in this thinking. Now some will surely find the coupling of Heidegger and Europe disconcerting, whatever deconstructive precision one brings to the question. But I want to underscore the last words I used in referring to Heidegger's legacy. For I believe it is undeniable that strong thinking engagements with Heidegger have come, in fact, from only a small number of European and North American philosophers, among whom we might count Garnell, and that its most important instantiations have occurred in the texts of those thinkers frequently referred to as the post-structuralists. The history of the latter engagement has hardly been written, and it has frequently been badly misrepresented. But the fact remains that the great readings of the last four decades lie in the texts of authors such as Jacques Derrida, Michel Foucault, and Jacques Lacan, and that the Heidegger to which Granel appeals is inseparable from that legacy. There is one trait that makes me risk this word great in referring to those readings, among you know, a number of others that could be cited. It is the fact that each of these authors took over from Heidegger the task of fundamental philosophy, a form of fundamental philosophy, or what we heard Grinnell term a few moments ago, fundamental justification. They did this in what is appropriately called a non-foundational mode, pursuing what Heidegger called the de destruction of metaphysical foundations. Derrida's rethinking of the essence of language with the thought of writing, Foucault's recasting of historical inquiry with his archaeology of knowledge, and Lacan's return to the foundations of psychoanalysis within the context of the human sciences, they all carry forward Heidegger's fundamental thinking and in fact do so explicitly. I'm convinced that one of our tasks today is to carry forward that dimension of this work in as much as the methodologies of the humanities are rapidly losing their distinctive natures. <clears throat> it is at this point that I want to return to the sentiments from which I started. For it is only in Europe that I have found a genuinely receptive ground for the kind of fundamental thinking or fundamental justification to which I have referred. Quite obviously, the post-structuralist texts I have cited have enjoyed immense success throughout the world, but one very, very rarely finds a thinking engagement with their fundamental designs at a level that is more than scholarly reporting or analysis. They are simply not taken over actively as fundamental projects. To put this quite crudely and reductively, they are read largely as theory, not philosophy. In Europe, on the other hand, fundamental questioning of this kind seems somehow to remain possible, or such is my impression, despite any number of institutional impediments and even disappointments. <clears throat> if we follow Granel, this would be because there remains a call or an obligation to think this thing called Europe in the multiple forms of its worldhood. To the extent that Europe somehow resists subsumption in the modern project sketched by Ganel, and his claim in this respect is obviously an immense one, he argues for an essential divergence between the autonomous organization of life along lines of production linked to the, to the name of America and forms of life proper to the natural European peoples, 
So, to the extent that we allow this divergence, there subsists a call to thinking of the fundamental order I have described in Europe. Europe, as a form of existence, demands its articulation, and the only adequate response will be one that moves to the level of an ontological engagement with a people's world, or a form of life as such. That's Grenell's argument. Now, I'm not at all certain <clears throat> that Grenell's assumptions will wholly withstand strong scrutiny. Obviously, there are dimensions of North American communal experience to which Ganel remains utterly oblivious in these reflections. And this is an, a stark and almost caricatural view of North American life, one from which Ganel's experience of American culture should have saved him. Although, I, I want to make jokes, he spent a, a year in Texas. But anyway. Um, <clears throat> I'm also not convinced that Europe is so easily dissociated from the monstrous formation to which Garnell appends an American corporate logo. And I'm not sure that the grounds of resistance he seeks are any more locatable in Scotland, or a Spanish province, say, than they are in Brooklyn. As a French philosopher once said to me during a visit to New York, I quote, there's a hell of a lot of Dasein here. <laughs> his, his suggestion being that a challenge for thought lay as much here as anywhere else. I am not convinced, in other words, that the true resistance to the new American order Ganel describes will be found in any regional zone or configuration, at least as far as the developed nations of the West and those that join them in development are concerned. Very different formations of community or networks of resistance have to be thought, particularly in the context of modern technology and media. And yet, and yet, I hold to my impression that a fundamental thought of this resistance is singularly possible in Europe and for reasons that are perhaps tied to Granel's fundamental point regarding that which calls to thought. A first point before I approach that level of analysis. I'm just going to approach it. I suspect quite strongly that my guiding sentiment is, shaped, is shaped by the historical place of philosophy in Europe. A kind of ongoing discursive legitimacy grounded in Europe's very symbolic order. This would account for my sense that there is some hope in Europe of advancing a community of questioning along the philosophical lines I have chosen. Philosophy has linked its destiny to Europe, as I noted above, and the reverse is to some degree also demonstrable in as much as European self-understanding has been inseparable over the past two and a half centuries at least from forms of fundamental philosophical reflection. I'll, I'll leave aside any attempt at a comparative statement related to North America, though if I were to try to develop this point, I would suggest that forms of artistic expression have played a more founding or fundamentally interrogating role in the last century. In any case, and to take this a bit further with regard to Europe, as Jean-Francois Lyotard argued frequently some years ago, this self-inquiry, this European self-inquiry, has involved at vital points, at least since the French Revolution, an acute knowledge of the precariousness of the symbolic order itself. In a, first step, in a first step, then, I believe it is safe to say that in my sentiment, in this, this feeling I've had, I've been responding to the vitality of philosophy itself in Europe's discursive space, and this despite the anemic and increasingly technocratic state of the European Academy. What I have experienced is nothing less than Europe's need for philosophy, a need founded on Europe's historically determined turn to philosophy in matters pertaining to self-reflection and self-definition. To this socio-political conditioning of my search for a philosophical ethos in Europe, I must also recognize a version of a point that I put aside at the outset, namely the suggestion that I have been returning to the provenance of the discourses to which I have devoted my work. For there is a matter of discursive continuity linked to the point I have made about the European symbolic order. The post-phenomenological philosopher working in North America over the last couple decades cannot but be constantly aware of the disjunction between the language employed in this field and the reigning discursive assumptions in the national context. The result is almost inevitably abstraction, either because the discursive constraints of the governing symbolic order are ignored, something that remains possible within the academy's disciplinary boundaries, or because the effort to meet them results in an emptying translation. I returned to America to work in my own language and in a search for concreteness, 